This is a series about the hidden histories of Britain's oldest family businesses. Few businesses last beyond two generations. Against the odds, these families have survived in their trades for more than three centuries. This is a 188,933rd day of Borsons at work. They've come through 50 recessions, the Industrial Revolution, two world wars and the rise of internet shopping. Yeah. Really, things were very sad after the war. There was no money. There was no money anywhere. We'll meet the present day head of each family as they face a crossroads in their working life. And we'll follow them as they go on a journey into the past of their business. Jonah Toy. Fantastic. So, I, was, I, was getting, I was very worried about Jonah. This time we tell a tale from the high street. The Balsons have been butchers for nearly 500 years, since Henry VIII was on the throne. Hello, Balson. Behind the counter today yeah. is Richard Balson. Vicar, doctor, we can sort out people's problems. Usually, it's, if they've got a problem, it's because they're not eating enough meat. Once a mainstay of every neighbourhood, butcher shops are increasingly rare. Richard is about to see how his family have kept going. Throat badly cut, oh blimey. He cut his throat with a knife. This is the history of the local butcher and of the British market town, told through the story of a single family business. Six days a week in Bridport, Dorset, something extraordinary happens. Richard Balson gets ready to butcher again, as his family has done for almost 500 years. Anything else? I know a lot about Henry VIII and Anne Boleyn. Because she got beheaded a year after we opened. We don't opened in 1535, shelter, and she yeah. was beheaded in 1536. The yeah, same yeah. year as Francesco Pizzario founded Peru. The same year as Thomas More was executed for treason. The like same year as memory. William Tynstell translated the first... Tyndall. Tyndall. See, you know I'm not lying, don't you? Yeah, yeah. He translated the first English edition of the Bible. They are. All in 1535. It's a hard thing to believe. Well, I don't look the old oldest joy. family butcher in. Is it England or Britain? The world. Entering Richard Balson's shop is like going back in time. Butchering traditions that have died out elsewhere in Britain are kept alive by the Balson family. Grandmother's recipe handed down generation to generation. Thank you very much. Four pounds, thank you. Hello. Lovely. We've got unusual stuff like ox cheeks and bath chaps uh, and sweetbreads. This is a bath chap. And this is an old, it's an old fashioned delicacy. This is the, uh, the cheek of the pig. Yes, what would you like, sir? Uh, can I have some... Diced rabbit? Yeah, and yeah. Um, some... 922. Oh, sure. It is my father and, and his mother that's taken in the office in the shop. This was on her 80th birthday. Alongside the pictures from the past, there's also a photo of the Balson Richard hopes will be the future of his shop. This is my son Billy. At the moment he's in London. He's not exactly hands-on, but hopefully one day he will be. Are you and your son still close then? All the oh yeah, we, 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 yeah we, I go up there and you know, we speak at least a couple of times a week on the phone. Richard assumes his butchery business has been passed down from father to son for over 20 generations since 1535. But he knows very few details about the past of his family. This is our present shop that we're in now. Um, and this would have been taken at Christmas time. Uh, a lot of the shops had pictures taken at Christmas for, with all the family and they made a big display. We get loads of people coming in the shop and they say, well, wait, who's this chap, who's this chap? And unfortunately, 
We don't know who any of the people are. Ho, ho, ho. Richard is about to learn all about his family's past. Names will be put on the faces in his old photos. And he'll discover what it has been like to be a butcher during the last 500 years. I'm going to find out where they were in the town and what they got up to, and, and I expect there would be a, one or two black sheep along the way, because they can't all be uh, top-notch citizens like myself. But, um, yeah, it's very. I'm looking forward to it. The Balsons have been lucky in their location. Nestling in the hills of the Dorset countryside, Bridport is a market town of 13,000 people. Market days have been Wednesdays and Saturdays, longer than anyone can remember. At least since 1278, when Edward I gave royal consent for Bridport to hold its markets. But even in Bridport, people find it hard to believe that the local butcher dates back almost 500 years. Richard has never seen authenticated proof to back up his claim that the Balsons were butchering in 1535. So he's retracing the steps of the local historian who told him the Balsons are Britain's oldest butcher. It was in about 1982 when we found out that we were England's oldest family butchers when uh, a chap called uh, Basil Short did a, did a lot of history and delved into the archives, so we could call ourselves England's oldest family butchers. Basil Short died ten years ago, but Richard recalls being told the evidence could be found in the Dorset County Archives. Yeah, that's it then, isn't it? That's what we want, isn't it? Dorset History Centre. Archivist Cassandra Johnson has a document to show Richard. It's a rental agreement for what used to be called a shamble, which was a stall in the meat market. Um, so it's in Latin. Yeah. Um, and it's quite heavily abbreviated, so obviously it won't be easy to read. John Bolston is renting a market stall in Bridport, and it's, it's between the shambles of Andrew Stone on the north side yeah. and John Gore on the south side. It's yeah. quite a good name for a butcher. Yeah, yeah. Spelling was very inconsistent. Yeah. And obviously, Boston's got the T in it. It's got the actual date there, did you say, the, in the year? Uh, well. um, it says in, in the 26th year of the reign of Henry VIII. Oh, right. Henry was crowned in 1509, so the 26th year of his reign was 1535, the year Richard believes his business was founded. But before he can heave a sigh of relief, Cassandra has a surprise for him. This one is actually from the year 1515. 1515. So yeah, it's a bit a good older. 20 years earlier. William Child and John Orchard in yeah. 1515 in Denture. And they're the officials of the town. Um, they're licensing Robert Balson to market stores. But it, it, and th this is definitely related. I think it's very plausible because you're in the same location and the Roberts um, do appear quite a lot in the Balsam line. Yeah, that is, yes, so, right. I mean, all those things together make it very plausible that they, yeah. are, they are related. Yeah. And this year was 15... 1515. 1515, goodness me. Yeah, that's amazing. It's a long time, isn't it? 1515. Fifteen fifteen is going right back to the early years of Henry VIII, when the king was still with his first wife, Catherine of Aragon. Thanks, you, Sandra. Pleasure. I'd have been less happy if you said that we weren't quite so old as we made out we were, but as it's that way, it's fantastic. And it's all been authenticated, hasn't it? The first recorded butcher in the Balson family Robert of 1515 was a tradesman, like Richard is today. The social status of the butcher has changed little over the centuries. 
But Robert Bolson worked in a Bridport that was very different from today's shop-lined high street. 500 years ago, British market towns only traded on market days, when they became a patchwork of separate marketplaces, each exclusively dedicated to anything from haberdashery to cooping barrels. One of the most important marketplaces sold only meat. This was known as the shambles. It was in Bridport's shambles that Robert Balson rented a stall in 1515. Business is 20 years older than you thought. Well, it's good. I, uh, I phoned my son and he, he couldn't. Uh, he, he thought, well, he thought it was really good actually. It's still in uh, King Henry VIII's reign and it's, uh, you know, from all our bags and stuff we got printed, it's only just one number to change 1535 to 1515. So that's a bit of luck. Now Richard wants to find out where Robert Balson did his butchery be quite interesting to see where we used to be. He's arranged to meet someone who can point out where Bridport's shambles once stood. Local archaeologist Peter Bellamy. Hello, Peter. Hello, Richard. How are you? How are you? Fine, fine. So you want to be about here. So the actual shambles, probably the end of them would be about here, yeah. um, roughly on that white line, I think. Yeah and then they'd be going this way. So one stall after another along the street. Yeah. Somewhere about there would be the other end of the, of, of the thing. So they were really right, right in the middle of the street. And you can you imagine the chaos for this building oh, stuck must in the middle. It quite um, a hustle, bustle, busy place, wasn't it, you know? Yeah. A year ago, maintenance on the gas main beneath Bridport's High Street accidentally exposed the remains of the shambles. We came across, well, two walls, although one of them, we, only one of them we've managed to expose properly. And you can see it in this photograph here, right at the bottom, yeah. is this the remains of a stone wall. That's the wall running along through yeah. here. And it probably had a series of arches, arcades, running along it where the stalls would be. So one of the walls really ran just along here, and the other one was about here. Yeah. Richard's shop on the outskirts of Bridport is only a five-minute walk from where Robert Balson did his butchering, right at the centre of town. And this map shows that when Bridport was a town of just a 1,000 people, there was room in the shambles for 10 butchers. That's about one butcher stall for every 20 households. There are no working shambles left anywhere in Britain. But Richard is determined to get as close as he can to the bloody reality of the working life of Robert Balson, the founder of his business. So he's left Dorset and is heading north. His destination is York. It is one of Britain's most ancient townscapes, at the heart of which still stands the remains of York shambles. Richard's guide to the working life of Robert Balson is historian of butchery, John Chartres. Good morning. Good morning, John. How are you, hey, Richard? The nice oldest butcher you. in Britain. The oldest, yeah. Do I look at? <laughs> Not particularly. No, thank, good <laughs> thank goodness for that. You said the right thing. <laughs> John begins by explaining that the word shamble just means a kind of butcher's block. Imagine a, a, a sort of six or eight foot long bench in which you'd, yeah. your animal, you put it onto the bench to cut. But if you imagine it in them days, I mean, there would have been just meat hung everywhere, wouldn't it? It would have been like, you'd have probably had a job to walk down yeah. through without sort of bumping into a carcass, I should think. A lot of noise as well. You'll have people presumably shouting abuse at each other yeah, and you, saying, hey, do I don't like think much of that, Jim. Do you think they have any special rules and regulations? There's virtually no health regulation. But on the whole, you know, you're not going to have, you know, I suppose cold stores full of meat that might go off. No. It's in, in bang, and out. eat out. 
500 years ago, there was no way to chill meat to prevent it rotting. So meat couldn't be transported or stored. Instead, on market days, butchers herded live animals into the shambles and killed them on the spot, almost to order. It was so messy, the word shambles has since come to mean chaos and disorder. The shambles is historically would have been where you, you actually did the killing, hence the advantages of a sloping site. Yeah, yeah, you to wash all the muck wash, away. Wash it down. I'm not quite sure you know, how quickly the cattle pick up the sense of what's happening. Yeah. But they'll smell blood fairly early, yeah, don't they? Yeah, yeah. And that, that spooks them. So there's the shambles is manure, it's animal noises, it's um, screams and squeaks. Really, it must have been one hell of a smell. Yeah. I don't mind a bit of mess, never have done. You've got, to, you've got to be able to get your hands dirty. It's a life which I personally would have loved because it was a busy, hectic lifestyle, uh, lots of interaction with people and animals coming to and fro, customers coming to and fro, and live ones in, dead ones out. Uh, um, it's, it's amazing. For centuries after 1515, the Balson name appears consistently in the records of those who rented a shamble in Bridport. It was a period in which the craft of butchery barely changed. In the mid-1600s, the Balsons survived the Civil War. A Thomas Balston fought with Bridport's parliamentarians. They survived the plague, which visited Bridport repeatedly until the late 1600s. The Balsons kept their place in the shambles for 250 years. They probably weren't the only butchers with an ancient lineage, but somehow they passed on their craft for over 10 generations. These days, it's rare to find a family where the children follow their parents for more than a couple of generations. I always knew I was going to be a butcher, and um, it's what Dad wanted, I guess, you know. He never said to me, oh, you've got to be a butcher and you've got to follow me. Not at all, but, I mean, it was just a, an opportunity of a lifestyle that, uh, that I wanted, I guess, you know. That's lovely. Looks like you can do this almost without thinking, Richard. Well, I learned all of my trade through watching my father, really, and just copying him and um, with his guidance, sort of overlooking you at first. Oh, I don't know, 16, 17, I suppose. Was he a stern teacher, your father? Yeah, he was a tough teacher, but it's better to be like that than having someone who doesn't really care who's what they're showing you. And, you know, you, there's only one way, and, that, and that's the right way. Richard's father, Don, died aged 88 in 2011. Jane, his sister, now looks after their widowed mum, Joan. A former Miss Bridport, Joan met Don at a dance in 1945, just after he'd come home from the Second World War. Oh, he was very handsome. Very handsome and, uh, of course, um, I, I realised they had, they had the butcher shop. My dad used to go out every weekend and buy the joint from there. We got married and I went to live up over the shop. When Joan moved into Don's shop, Britain was on its knees after five years of conflict. Meat was still rationed. Each adult was allowed just over a pound a week, about a third of what we consume today. He had a hard time, with, like I said, with all the rationing and that. You'd get some lady come and said, oh, Mr. Borson, can't you let me have a bit more? He'd say, well, um, I know what, I can get you some tripe, because that wasn't Russian. They had to clean it, which wasn't very pleasant. I know it wasn't very pleasant, but I mean, um, but it was lovely, beautiful. Having got through the war and rationing, Don is now held up as an example in the Balsam family. 
he showed what it takes to keep the business going. It's uh, hard work, dedication, and you've got to do it. If you don't do it, then it's gone, because so many butchers have gone. That's the trouble now. Mm. Richard's doing really, you know, really, really, really well. I think he really enjoys working in the shop. He's very passionate about keeping it, you know, going. Richard is trying to secure the future of the Bolson legacy by passing on what his father taught him to his only child, Billy. He knows that he knows how to do all this, uh, this sort of cutting up. They say this is just basic butchery, really. <laughs> But having completed basic butchery, Billy also trained as an accountant. He's got a very good job in London, um, but hopefully he will come back. He wants to come back. He doesn't want to stay there all his life, but at the moment he's got a very uh, nice lifestyle and a very good job. And how old is he? Old he three? is uh, 33. I don't know how whether Billy will ever, you know, Richard's son will come and learn to trade, there's nothing to say he won't later on. He may well do later on. But what would it feel like to you if Balsams didn't carry on? Devastation, <sighs> wouldn't he? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, it's... It, it's it, it would be awful. For the moment, Richard is putting aside any concerns about the future. He's returning to his exploration of the Balsams' past. And there's a crucial question on his mind. How did the Balsons get from a shamble into the shop which Richard has today? He's in the nearby city of Bath to find out what happened to Bridport shambles. He's meeting historian Peter Borsay, an expert on town life in 18th century Britain. Hello, Peter. The big word in 18th century towns is improvement. Yeah. Improve the environment of the town. Towns saw themselves as civilised places. Um, and there's a sort of revolution going on in the later 17th and 18th century by which towns are remodelling themselves and trying to become more civilised. And particularly, they're adopting a building revolution which is going on, which is classicism. <laughs> Peter has asked Richard to meet him in Bath because here you can still see how the classical revolution affected the working lives of butchers. But you've got to remember Bath is one of the most elegant towns of the yeah. 18th century. Yep. And what was happening in Bath was dramatic. Virtually where we're standing, there'd been a market there right. and the butchers had operated from this open street site. Now, you as a butcher would have been on the worst trades because you were slaughtering animals, you had the meat on show. So they move the butchers from here, they take them out of the street and they build a brand new guild hall and sort of extend the market area behind it. The butchers were just the first to be moved off the street. By the 1770s, all of Bath's market traders were hidden away in the guild hall. In the following decades, the classical revolution spread towards Bridport. Towns liked to compete with each other, and there were other towns in Dorset which were also getting rid of their shambles. Yeah. And they'd all been demolished, and the butchers were moved behind the line of the street. The Bridport shambles were demolished in 1786, and a new town hall was built at the side of the high street. Upstairs was an elegant room where the town council met. On the ground floor was a closed market, given over exclusively to butchery. The town hall's market was smaller than the shambles, but some of the butchers from the shambles were able to carry on their trade here, hidden behind the elegant classical facade. So Bridport's just doing what there were other towns... What everyone done. else was doing. In Bridport, you know, they were in right in the middle of the town, bang in the middle of the road, and they were, like you say, they were in the way and they wanted to tidy up a bit. And, you know, in a way, it didn't really matter what the butchers felt. No. You know, they, they were expendable. They simply had to be moved. Yeah. Whether any butchers protested this drastic change to their working lives isn't known. But by the mid-19th century, there were no traditional shambles left anywhere in Britain. 
It's something that had to be done. Obviously, you can't have people bringing animals in, leading them in on a rope to be slaughtered in the middle of the town for all to see. You know, it's all for the, the best, really. And, and there, there was no, they couldn't argue about it. They just had to be moved, really. These days, the Balsam business is based on the outskirts of Bridport, just beyond the River Brit. Richard is heading back into the centre of town. He wants to find out if his ancestors were among those butchers who carried on in the town hall after the shambles were demolished. There's a bit of a grey area, that, where, where they sort of moved to, and, you know, that's the sort of in-between times, which is uh, I don't know a lot about. Even today, there is still a butcher in Bridport's town hall, Richard's friend, Phil Frampton. Morning, Richard. Morning, Phil. How are you? Very well, thank you, sir. Nice, nice to, to see, see you. you. Nice to see you. We're not rivals, are we? No, we help each other out if we can. That's what it's all about. We're in a different thing. Obviously, Richard being over the bridge. Yeah, over the bridge. Yeah. <laughs> Sounds like a troll, doesn't it? We've got, um, we've got, um, you know, a, our footfall is a lot more here because we're in the centre of a town. Well, if somebody wants, comes in here and Phil hadn't got it, I might have it here, send them down to me and vice versa. I mean, you know, you've got to work together in business. Phil Frampton is the first in his family to be a butcher, but he knows about the history of the Balsons. I know they started up here in 1515, which is 500 years ago in the old shambles. And you know that they were in here? They were in here, were they, some time? Yeah. yeah. If you, have you seen this? That's the, that's oh, that's the, the town hall when, the, when they moved in here in yeah. the 1780s or something, was it? Uh, 70, yeah, it was 1780s. 17 something. summit, wasn't it? I'll get this down for you. Let's have a look at that. Yeah, let's get me goggles on. So that gives out all the individual stores. This is the front of the shop here. One, yeah. two, three. Hence these three windows. Right, right. This 200-year-old plan reveals that where Frampton's butchers now stands, there used to be over 30 little butcher stalls. An undated document found in the archives lists the butchers who rented these stalls. At number 11, there is A. Balsam. On Richard's family tree, the only A. Balson is Arthur. He was born in 1820, just a generation after the town hall was built. This one here, right, which is that wooden block there, yeah, the, the, the bookcase. That's where his saw was. It's amazing, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So if we turn the clock back, better start work. Yeah. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Here, Arthur Balson slaughtered animals, carved up carcasses and sold his meat. It was cramped, but the Balsons were still at the centre of Bridport. In the mid-19th century, when Arthur took on his stall in the town hall, the Balsons had been in business for over 300 years. It was now the Victorian age, a society built on the two pillars of trade and respectability. And the Balson story was about to take a dramatic turn. The family tree reveals that since way back in the era of the shambles, the Balsons had passed on their business from father to son. Arthur broke that ancient tradition and very nearly ended the Balson family business. Arthur is buried somewhere in the graveyard just opposite Richard's shop. Although many graves are neglected and forgotten, the local vicar, Reverend Peter Edwards, has some information about the Balsons buried here. He's even read a newspaper report about Arthur. So these two graves here are both members of, of the family. Sadly, this stone has fallen over at some yeah, stage so in, that's the, the, back in of the last it, decade or two. But there is some writing that we've sort of deciphered from, from uh, records uh, from yeah. the underside. 
We're here to talk about Arthur Bolson. Arthur, yeah. Uh, who was a sort of distant uncle of sorts, I yeah, think. Yeah, that's of right. Yours, who died in July of 1859. Right. And the funeral service was held in early August of that year. The burial was done on the Sunday morning here. Yeah, on was, a Sunday morning? It was quite interesting, yeah. Yeah, well, a, well, that's probably because they were working on all the well, other days. Well, quite possibly. Sort of... About 100 fellow tradespeople of the town oh, right, yeah. came to support yeah. the family and to, to, to be in attendance at yeah. the funeral. The huge crowd of mourners suggests Arthur was a popular figure, but some may have come to gawp at the climax of a scandal. Arthur um, was living with, and this must have caused some, something of a scandal at the time, the, the woman who was actually married to somebody else. Right. Uh, so so in, in the standards of the Victorian age, yeah, that must, not have, good, must have caused it? something no. of a local stan scandal. Her yeah. name was Charlotte Wordsall. Uh, and uh, her husband uh, was, was away, and Charlotte was living with Arthur, yeah. together with her son, Tom. And obviously, uh, Arthur took to uh, uh, Tom, as well as, as yeah, being yeah, yeah. in a relationship with Charlotte. The paper reports that Arthur treated Tom like his own son, digging deep into his pockets so Tom could have a good education. Very likely, Arthur was thinking of handing the family business on to the child of his lover, so ending the Balson tradition. Then something terrible happened. Arthur used to play sort of uh, fights and what have you, including which he used to pretend that Tom had got a gun and he would play dead when uh, Tom fired yeah. this gun at him. Sadly, one uh, day at the end of July, in 1859, Tom came back from school one day, uh, found uh, a, a gun which had been loaded, right, uh, yeah. uh, uh, oh, not, known, not known to him, and uh, pretended to, to shoot Arthur, and sadly it went off, and he was killed instantly there and then on the spot, uh, which caused obviously a great uh, consternation and upset to the people of the town and, and all those who knew him and so the family. So how old was beyond. Arthur? He was 39, I think, if right. I recall, something of those, that sort of, 38, 39, uh, that sort of, sort, sort of age. Right. Uh, so, and obviously, Tom, he might have inherited the business, know, and that, then it would have been a different yeah. story. Well, Pratt, it was an act of God. <laughs> Whether young Tom Wurzel attended the funeral of the man he'd killed is not recorded, and his name disappears from the local records after that. It's known that he died in London, aged 26. His lover's son was out of the picture, but Arthur's sudden death meant that in 1859 the Balsam business couldn't carry on father to son. Luckily, someone else in the family came forward to keep the Balsam tradition going, Arthur's younger brother, Richard. This Victorian Richard Balsam is the great-great-grandfather of Richard, who runs the shop today. Do you reckon we can turn that round? Lay it, lay it the other way. Yeah, there, now you can see it. There's Arthur. Died 1859, age 39. Poor man. What a shock that must have been. Afternoon. In 1859, when Arthur Balsam died and the business was carried on by his brother Richard, Britain was the richest country in the world. Meat consumption was rising dramatically. Those who could afford to ate meat in breakfast, lunch and dinner. There was also a population boom. In two generations, Bridport had grown from three
historian Richard Balson, who'd taken over from scandalous Arthur, found a way to carry on butchering despite the restrictions in the town hall. The 1871 census reveals that 12 years after Arthur's death, his brother Richard was increasing his income, doubling up as a pub landlord at the Boot Inn. Now converted into a house, the Boot Inn was in a residential area of Bridport, near where Richard's shop is today. Many of Victorian Bridport's publicans already had second trades. There were pubs which sold leather goods, others that baked bread. At some pubs you could buy meat alongside the beer, prepared in a slaughterhouse behind the bar. But what a publican butcher like the Victorian Richard Balson really needed was to have his own shop. A technological breakthrough paved the way for the late Victorian butcher's shop. Come down and see the big fridge. And it's quite, you know, it's a good sized fridge where you can come in and it's nice for have plenty of racks for hanging all your sausages and bodies of beef, lamb and pork. Along with steam power, refrigeration was one of the earth-shattering inventions of the 19th century's industrial revolution. It made it possible to store perishable foods. Sweet chilli, merguez, smoky pork. That's a rump of beef there. That, and you, that is the darkness of that. That's been hung for three weeks. In the shambles and even in the town hall, butchers had killed animals almost to order. Refrigeration made it possible to keep plentiful stocks of all the cuts the customers might want. This broke the link between selling meat and killing animals. Soon, the slaughtering and preparation took place a healthy distance away from the high street. While in the centre of town, the butchers could sell their meat like any other shopkeeper. A couple of loins of pork. In the late 19th century, as a direct result of refrigeration, butchers reappeared on the British high street. This is when the Balsons moved into their shop. Most likely, thanks to their first fridge. Moving into a shop was a crucial moment in the story of the Balsons. But which member of the family founded his shop at 9 West Allington is a mystery to Richard. It was initially called R, J and W Balson. There's a photo showing the shop trading under this name in about 1890. But the people in the photo are unidentified. And a second photo adds to the mystery. It suggests that there was another business called Balson & Sons, which was once based next door at number seven. To help him work out which Balson was the father of his shop, Richard is meeting local historian Richard Sims. Hello, Richard. Hello, good. Nice to see you. Yeah, nice to see you good. again. I believe this to be when they came into this shop. This is this shop. And this is uh, just prior to that when they were next door. Or Such a source of information on all of this. The uh, book of Balson facts handed down from my father, which may not be exactly right, but pretty near right. We don't know who any of the people are. I don't know, maybe you uh, could... Well, I, I've um, spent some time in the record office in Dorchester looking through the rates records yeah. of Bridport yeah. over the period of 1880 through to 1895. I've got a bit of paper here to help you out on that. Oh, right, right, right. I've just got the rumps to cut for the Ulster, all right. From Bridport's rates records, Richard Sims has tried to work out which member of the family started the shop. The story begins next door at number seven with Balson and Sons. To reveal the order of events, Richard Sims has transcribed some of his research. 1st of April, 1887, Balsons and Sons rented at number seven from John Hoare, who had the whole of the alleyway going backwards. And we see here, in 1892, they vacated number seven before moving to next door. The film what was it become R.J. Yeah, and W. Balson. Yeah, yeah. 
So, so it's this, 1892. Yeah, so this, this shop will date probably from 1892, yeah. within six months of that. Yeah. Whereas the other shop was 18, almost certainly early 1887. Yeah. Comparing the dates from the rates records against the Balson family tree makes it possible to deduce which family members were behind each shop. In 1887, when Balson and Sons was founded, the Victorian Richard Balson, who had doubled up as a landlord of the boot, was still alive. If we look at this photograph, this is the earlier one. That's right. There's Balsons and Sons at the top here. We can now say that that has to be Richard Balson from the boot. Richard of the boot died in 1890, survived by three sons. It was the eldest, Robert John, in partnership with the youngest brother, William, who carried on their father's butchery business. Because the family had only rented at number seven, the brothers Robert John and William moved next door. They owned number nine. The Balsons were on the up. So the other photograph is now R.J. and W. Balsons. So we must be looking, I imagine, maybe Robert John and William mm. as the two main characters here. Fascinating. Thank you. But the family tree leads to a deeper mystery. Richard, who runs the shop today, is descended from neither Robert John nor William. His great-grandfather is the middle brother, Richard John. Richard John, who actually lived here, was a stonemason. He was here into the, eight, into the 1890s before moving to Neath. Are you disappointed to discover you're not descended from the two brothers who founded your shop? No, not, not at all. I mean, it's, it, it's uh, still in the family, that's the main thing. I mean, um, uh, you know, people go off and do other things. Um, yeah, that's just how it is. Richard John Balson, seen here in this photo, spent most of the rest of his life in Neath, Wales. He enjoyed a profitable career there as a stonemason and never joined the family business. But somehow, the Balson butcher shop has ended up in the hands of the descendant of Richard John the stonemason. Richard's great-great-uncles, Robert John and William, moved into a shop at just the right moment. The start of the 20th century is now seen as the golden age of the British High Street. Where the Balsons are, on the outskirts of Bridport, was then a parade of shops, where people could buy everything they wanted without leaving their immediate neighbourhood. Almost nothing is known about the working life of Richard's great-great-uncles Robert, John and William. All that's been turned up is a local newspaper cutting from about a hundred years ago. Guessing competition on Wednesday week, Messrs. Balson Brothers Butchers of West Allington exhibited in their shop the carcass of a bullock, which they supplied at Messrs. W. Morey and the Sons Christmas Fat Stock Show and sell for a weight guessing competition. On a card, the actual weight of the animal was given at 39 stone one pound. The winners were for prize two pound two shillings to Miss C. Borson of West Allington. <laughs> Sounds like a fix to me. 39. Discovering that the Balsam shop was founded by his great-great-uncles leads Richard to a further question. How did the shop end up in his hands? All right. All right. Yeah, how are you doing? He knows that the answer must lie in the story of the Balsam who came after his great-great-uncles, his grandfather, known in the family as Pop. This is my uh, grandfather in 19... 20, delivering the meat on the horse and cart. I can just about remember my grandfather sat in a chair. I was only about four when, it, when he died. And uh, but we, get, we get old customers come in and they, and they remember 
um, remember him in the shop and he used to walk out there used to be a pub just along the road called the old inn about 60 yards and and he'd go out to the old inn and have a have a pint you know pop was the son of the balsam who became a stonemason and went to live in wales as a boy pop didn't go to wales with his father but stayed in bridport the 1901 census reveals that pop then aged 10 was living above the balsam shop with his uncle, Robert John, who was unmarried and had no children of his own. This would have been seen as normal in those days. Being brought up by his uncle, Robert John, Pop had the opportunity to learn the craft of butchery. Then, in 1927, Pop's other uncle, William Balsam, died. He was survived by just one daughter, and women butchers were almost unheard of in the 1920s. Robert John was still unmarried and childless and aged almost 70. To keep the shop in the Balsam family, Robert John decided that Pop, the nephew he'd brought up, should take it on. But Robert John didn't deal with Pop as if he were his son, as Richard has just found out. This is some old documents that have come out of the safe, which oh, relate under to stairs. under the stairs, yeah, which relate to when uh, Robert John, in about 1928, decided to um, sell the business to um, to Pop um, for a sum of a thousand pounds. Pop didn't have any money, so he borrowed it off of his wife's brother who uh, was a Bill Spencer. The thousand pound was for the, uh, the property and fixtures, fittings and goodwill of the business. A thousand pounds in 1928 is 50,000 in today's money. He must have been very grateful to um, Bill Spencer for lending him that thousand pound, really, because obviously without that, he couldn't have, you know, that could, if, if he hadn't lent him that money, who knows what would have happened to the business? The deal between Pop and Robert John wasn't unusual, and there's no evidence of any awkwardness between nephew and uncle. It took Pop just four years to pay off the loan, presumably using the profits of the shop. And Robert John wouldn't be dependent on his nephew, because he now had money to fund the care he'd need in his retirement. But then Robert John seems to have been written out of the Balsam story. Until a few days ago, Richard had never even heard of the family member who founded his shop. To find out more about his great-great-uncle, he's going to look through some old newspapers. He wants to see if he can find any reference to Robert John Balsam. Right, here we go. An inquest held at Bridport on Wednesday evening on Mr. Robert John Borson, aged 70. He retired only a year or two ago and was unmarried, who was discovered in the wash house lying across a heap of coal with his throat badly cut. Throat badly cut? Oh, blimey. Mr. Borson was alive when the doctor arrived hurriedly on the scene, but died about half an hour later. A verdict of suicide, whilst of unsound mind, was recorded by the deputy coroner for West Dorset. Mm. He cut his throat with a knife. Well, it said he was retired. I wonder if being retired, he just... There's some people, they just can't cope with being retired. And I mean, sometimes there's a void there, which was taken up by work previously. And, and when you retire, if you completely shut yourself off, then, then you can become... Um, you know, a bit lonely, a bit reclusive, a bit, um, you know, you'd think with our, with the Borsons being, uh, you know, all this family orientated where they hand it on to one generation to the next, he could have carried on there as long as he wanted to, just gone in maybe one day a week, two days a week. My father, he was still doing the books at 88, 87, you know, um, and he always kept his hand in. I didn't just work with my father, you know, we went to football matches together, we played skittles together, uh, we went to the pub and had a pint together. I uh, go out with my son now, uh, um, you know, it's nice, I don't see as much of him as I'd like to, but 
but uh, um, yeah, it's lovely. I think the father and son relationship. You know, it, it doesn't matter how old they are; they're 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 your son all your life, and and you you know you still sort of worry about them and care for them and love them, and uh, uh, and that's what being a father is really. But unfortunately, he didn't have any children, did he? So uh, he might have missed out there, but I don't know. According to the local newspaper, the townsfolk of Bridport paid their respects at the funeral of Robert John Balson. Among the mourners was his nephew, Pop, who left a floral tribute which read, In Loving Memory. A few days after finding out all about Robert John and his nephew, Pop, Richard welcomes his own nephew. This is our new 1515 shirts that we've just had, had done uh, since we found out we were uh, established 20 years earlier. So that's for you and a nice okay. RJ Balson and Son hat. Put them on and I'm going to put you to work for five minutes. Right. Oliver Balson is the only son of Richard's only brother, Michael. Instead of joining the family business, Michael became a professional footballer. His career took him to America, and he settled there. I've worked it out. This is the 188,933rd day of Borsons at work since 1515. <laughs> Straight down the middle, kidney each side, nice and straight. There it is. Last time I, that happened was um, 15 years ago. Probably, 15 years ago. Here. Yep. By this man right here. Yeah. And I was seven, eight years old. I have kind of memories of being in the shop. Hello. <laughs> They're trying to put me to work. <laughs> <laughs> but every year. Oliver is in Bridport to visit his English family. He's also here on business. It's hard to get butchery out of the Balson blood, and Oliver sells sausages online in America. Oliver's business is completely separate from Richard's butcher shop, which does no online trading. But Richard advises Oliver with sausage recipes and encourages him to trade on the Balson heritage. It's almost unbelievable, you know, when you say 1500s and America is, is only half that old. I think most people are fairly skeptical. They're like, hmm, you know, it's, it's almost like you, it's, such, it's, it's such a grandiose claim that there's instant kind of skepticism to how could it possibly be that old. You know, filling out paperwork for the USDA and they'll, you know, they ask like, how old is your business? And sometimes I'm just cheeky and I just say 400 and, you know, 98 years. And then in, every single time I, I do that, they, they say there's some kind of typo, there's some mistake, you know. Oliver used to have a career as an academic, running the online sausage business in his spare time. He's now given up his university post to concentrate on selling meat full-time. So for Oliver, it's important to keep faith that there will always be a balsam butcher in Bridport. None of us know what the future holds, but I think it's a pretty, pretty good chance you'll find a butcher shop at this location with a balsam name on it, a bet the farm on it. The balsam shop has done well to survive as long as it has because the late 20th century was difficult for butchers. Pop, Richard's grandfather, died in 1961, and the business was passed on to his son, Don. In the 60s, Don, Richard's father, enjoyed the final great age of the neighborhood butcher. Towards the end of the 20th century, shopping habits changed. The number of butcher shops in Britain fell from about 50,000 to less than 10,000. Many high streets and market towns completely lost their butchers. But the Balsons were still going strong when Don died in 2011.
Richard has come to Bridport's beach at six in the morning to share some memories of his father. Don Balson used to come here every day for a quick dip before he opened the shop. I'm very lucky to have spent 40 years sort of working with him and he's taught me all I know. And uh, when he died, obviously, it's really difficult to go into work and him not be there sort of thing. And uh, a chap came in one day and he said, oh, what's the matter with you, Richard? You don't look, you know, you don't look yourself. And I said, oh, father just died. And, you know, he said, oh, sorry to hear that. And I said, it's very difficult after, you know, spending every day of your life working with him and then all of a sudden he's, he's gone. Uh, and the chap, he put it into perspective, really. He said, well, when you think of all the good times you've had, he said, because he said, my father, he said, died when I was only sort of 14, 15, and I never even had the experience or the memory to even have a pint in a pub with him. Uh, and, I mean, that put it into perspective, really, and you think, yeah, I have been lucky. And, uh, and you know, you think of the good times and the happy memories you've got. And, um, and after he said that little... Uh, sentence, you know, it made me feel a bit better, really. Eleven slices of a ham. Eleven a ham. Richard. Right. Let's kick off with that, then. Right, OK. How's the missus? Very well, thank you, Richard. All right, Turn thanks up. very much. Thanks. Have a good weekend. Thanks. Bye. God save the Queen. There we are, another day done. Richard has now completed his journey into the past of his family. He's learnt that staying in business for 500 years has been a constant struggle for the Balsons. They've kept going despite revolutionary social change and personal tragedy. How has learning about previous generations who faced crises and survived them altered the way he sees the future of his family business? My father went on till he was 88, so I've got another 30, 33 years sort of thing. So, I mean, a lot can happen in 33 years. Um, we can miss a generation and maybe the next generation will take hold. You know, who knows? We've survived suicides and, and being blown off with a shotgun, you know. The main thing is that we're still here and we're still making a living and we're still enjoying what we do. And, um, you know, and long may it continue. First order of the day. Next time we meet the toys who've been making regalia since the 1700s. This is an OBE, which is something I think we're very well known for doing. Toys is a traditional firm in a modern world. Can its rich history help it flourish? Absolutely magical. Discover the secrets of successful, resilient enterprises and the latest insights from business history. Go to bbc.co.uk slash hiddenhistories and follow the links to the Open University.